We've been in this series on family, and today I want to zero in on marriage. I want to zero in specifically on marriage. Um, Like I've been saying, though, this applies to everyone. Whether you're single, you need to know what a a godly marriage looks like before you get into one. Uh, If you're flirting, uh, you really need to get this. Uh, If you're engaged, you need this. If you're married, listen, marriage is always a work in progress, so I believe you can always get better, right? The goal is to get better, not bitter. The goal is to get better, not bitter. If you're married in this place, help me preach today. The word is to get better, not bitter. Maybe you're having some issues in your marriage. I believe this is going to help you. I believe that, that God is for marriage. God invented it. Therefore, God has a plan for it. Uh, Whether you've been married for a year, you've been married for 15 years, some of y'all are blessed to be married for 20, 30, 40. Uh, Some of you guys, you guys are expert in this, uh, so forgive me, some of you guys who've been married forever. uh, We're doing our best to try to help all of us do the will of God. Can you say amen? Amen. So I'm going to title this talk, The Ingredients of a Godly Marriage. The Ingredients of a Godly Marriage. And all the wives told the husband to take notes. <laughs> we got one, one obedient husband in the house. We're going to read from the book of Ephesians chapter 5. Book of Ephesians chapter 5. It's going to sound a little bit different because I'm going to read from the message translation, which is a paraphrase of scriptures. But sometimes I like to switch it up so we don't get familiar with the scriptures. So the message reads this way. It says, out of respect for Christ, be courteous, reverent to one another. Wives, understand and support your husbands in ways that show your support for Christ. The husband provides leadership to his wife the way Christ does to his church. Not by domineering, but by cherishing. So just as the church submits to Christ as he exercises such leadership, wives should likewise submit to their husbands. Husbands, go all out in your love for your wives, exactly as Christ did for the church. A love marked by giving, not getting. Christ's love makes the church whole. His words evoke her beauty. Everything he does and says is designed to bring the best out of her. Dressing her in dazzling white silk, radiant with holiness. And that is how husbands, how to love their wives. They're really doing themselves a favor since they're already one in marriage. No one abuses his own body, does he? No, he feeds and pampers it. That's how Christ treats us, the church, since we are part of his body. And this is why a man leaves father and mother and cherishes his wife. No longer two, they become one flesh. This is a huge mystery, and I don't pretend to understand it all. What is clearest to me is the way Christ treats the church. And this provides a good picture of how each husband is to treat his wife, loving himself in loving her, and how each wife is to honor her husband. Out of respect for Christ, be courteously reverent to one another. Can you say amen? Amen. So, ingredients of a godly Marriage. Notice I say a godly marriage, not just a marriage. It's one thing to get married. It's another thing to have a healthy, godly marriage. We know that there's a major difference between a marriage and a godly marriage. Where we're doing exactly what Scripture says a marriage should look like. Why? Because the number one thing we need to Settled today, my friends, is that marriage is God's idea. 
It's not our idea. We didn't come up with this concept of marriage. By the way, we talked about this in the back. When I go like this, that means you're going to my next point. Marriage is God's idea. We're working on our cues. <laughs> it's behind the scenes. Give you a little sneak peek. Guys, when I go like, okay. Marriage is God's idea. It's not our idea. It's not a social construct. As much as society is trying to create their own version of it. But God invented marriage. God created marriage. Right from the beginning. In Genesis chapter 1. What do we read in Genesis chapter 1? The original concept of marriage. In Genesis 1, verse 27 and 28, what does he say? He says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said, be what? Fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth, subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea, in the birds, in the sky, over living creatures that moves on the ground. Right? So right from the beginning, God established his heart for marriage, his heart for the mission of why two people should come together. If you take your notes, God says, first of all, I created you in my image. So I want you to reflect who I am. Which, number, by the, right away, that's different from what the world says. The world says, I'm, I want to get married to be happy. God says, no, I want you to be married to reflect me. Because if you reflect me, then you might get happiness. Every time you, you aim for happiness, you don't get it. That's already a message. That was free. <laughs> Created mankind in his own image. In other words, to reflect who he is as God. Then he blessed them. Right? God blesses the marriage. God puts his hand on it. It's a, it's a powerful thing. This is why Paul says it's a mystery because Two people come together and the presence of God in the Holy Spirit comes and says, I'm here to anoint and bless you to be able to do everything I've called you to do as a couple. That's why, listen, if you're not married yet, be very, 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 very careful who you marry. Because you want to marry someone who wants the will of God who wants the touch of God, who wants the presence of God. The Bible says, be careful to not be unequally yoked. In other words, you are all in for the things of God. He or she could care less about the things of God. Let's, guess what? You're not going to get the full blessing of God over your life. If you're not married yet, spare yourself the headache. She's so cute. She is, but she, does she love Jesus? He's so fine. <laughs> you blew my mind. Well, that's because you don't have Jesus in your heart. You're letting a man blow your mind. Oh, y'all ain't ready for this. <laughs> no, the word that God uses when he brings them together is compatibility. That's the word he uses. Not fine. Not cute, compatible. In other words, go beyond the cuteness and see, are we compatible in the spirit? Are we compatible in mind, body, and spirit? The first thing you see is physical, but you got to go deeper than that and look at the emotions and look at the spirit and look at the goals and look at the drives, look at the passion, look at the devotions, look at the commitment, look at the things that matters. Because God says, I have a plan and a purpose for this marriage. Every time I do marriage class, I always say, you're not getting married just for you. You're getting married for the purposes that God has for you. And one of the purposes is, is to be a living testimony of who God is. That's the purpose of marriage. Your marriage is supposed to glorify God. So others can say, wow, look at them. Their marriage is different. Why? There's a blessing and an anointing on it. 
There's the presence of God on it, as opposed to the way a lot of people talk about marriage nowadays. They talk about it always in a negative connotation. Why? There's no blessing on it. So I've always said this, I'll say it again. I don't want to hang out with anyone who doesn't have a happy marriage. Don't come jack my stuff up. One dude tried to mess with me one time. He's like, oh, you're so whooped. You can't wait to go home. I was like, yeah, I get to go home. Where are you going? Where are you going? You going to go shoot pool again? <laughs> oh, man. I'm having too much fun. I don't know about y'all. He blessed them. He says, be fruitful and multiply. Like, I have a purpose and a plan. Obviously, it starts with the physical, be fruitful and multiply. But he wasn't just talking about physical children. He's talking about spiritual, to be fruitful, to multiply. Some of you guys, listen, I got a word for some of y'all who are like older saints. You're not going to like me for this. But some of you older saints are not contributing. You've stopped being fruitful. You stopped multiplying. In other words, you've coasted. You decided, been there, done that, I don't have to do it. No, no, it's your job now to mentor others into this thing. (laughs) Seriously, though, there's no retiring from this journey unless you go to heaven. Hey, if you've been along the block a few times, how about you teach some of our younger ones how to get around the block and how to do this thing better? (laughs) Not, you know, this generation. Yeah, what about your generation? How were you guys? Every generation talks about the other generation like you guys had it figured out. Don't you come lie to me. I know the 60s. I've read it. I've I've done the history. Y'all didn't have it figured out in the 60s. 70s? Y'all were crazy. The 80s? Y'all were confused. And then the 90s, we came in. (laughs) So seriously though. It takes the village to help us all have a healthy marriage and all of us should be investing in another married couple and bless them and help them on this journey if you've been around the block a few times. Can you say amen? Amen. It says be fruitful and multiply, like multiply your influence. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus, is to multiply your influence. It's to show a society what it looks like to have something healthy. To live a healthy marriage and to be healthy parents. I'll talk about parenting next week. But it's our responsibility, my friends. You don't just get married to be happy. You get married to be on a mission. To live the mission that God has for you. He says, fill the earth. Subdue the earth. In other words, God is like, I've given you the mandate to rule. How awesome is that? If you're a believer... You have the authority of God in you to rule. To not be ruled by the world, but to live above the level of sin and mediocrity and to live on purpose. Like if you have a passion for something, where do you think that comes from? It comes from your creator. Imagine if all the believers own in on their passion and really decided, I'm going to use my passion for the glory of God and to edify people. That's the purpose why we're here on earth. That's the purpose why when you get saved, he doesn't ship you up to heaven. He saves you and says, now go, bring heaven to others. Bring heaven to your business. Bring heaven wherever you find yourself. Whatever your passion is, us married couples, bring it to others. So marriage has a mission attached to it. That's what I'm trying to get to. There's a question I want you to consider. How can our marriage reflect God's image and advance his kingdom? How can our marriage reflect God's image and advance his kingdom? Hear me on this. It was never just, let's just get a bigger house and bigger cars and bigger this and bigger that so we can be bigly disappointed. (laughs) Nothing wrong with those things, but man, like that can't be the goal. Like what happens after that? Got the bigger house, got the bigger car, then what? There has to be, I believe this, if, if God's put in your heart to get a bigger house, maybe saying, so you can host small groups, so you can bring mentorship in, so you can help other people. If it's just for you, 
Trust me, that's not the God we serve. God blesses you to be a blessing. Your marriage is to bless others. See, I don't know if you noticed this, but when you read scriptures, it's interesting. The enemy did not attack Adam until he got married. He let him chill in the garden. And some theologians believe that Adam was alone for many years. And we know this because he started talking to animals. It wasn't until he started talking to animals that God was like, all right, it's about that time, y'all. This man needs a wife. He's getting weird. Adam out here talking about TikTok, like, check out my goats. <laughs> I guarantee you, if he had a phone, he's TikToking. Y'all seen this turtle? <laughs> I'm having too much fun. Why, though? Why is that? Please hear me out friends, because the enemy knows the greatest reflection of God on earth is a healthy marriage. Amen. And he knows, man, when two people are on the same page with God's will and purpose, they are unstoppable. Amen. Why do you think your marriage is always under fire? There's an enemy who hates it. There's an enemy who knows. Listen, how, as parents, you can identify with this. Nothing Worse than seeing your kids sick. If you could, you would take their place. So think about that. Why does the enemy attack the marriage? Because he knows that's the best way for me to hurt the creator. When he sees his kids hurting. That's why we got to take this stuff seriously. As man and woman of faith. When there's, when there's chaos in the marriage. When there's fights. Please pay attention. You're not fighting each other. You're fighting the enemy who is trying to come between you and trying to ruin what God is trying to do with you. So please don't fight each other. Fight with each other and for each other. Like that, that changed my perspective on marriage when I realized, wow, we are a team. Now for some of you, you're like, Pastor, that's not revelation. For me, it was. It changed the way I fight with her because I didn't want to fight to win anymore. I want to fight for us to win. Because in our pride, we fight to win and we lose our marriage. Don't raise any hands, but how many fights have you won and you slept on the couch? How many of y'all in that couch with your pride? I ain't saying sorry. She gonna say sorry while I rewatch Sports Center for the third time this tonight. My mind is just go. Can I get a witness in this church? Wake up in the morning with your pride, ego hurting, back hurting. Kids are like that. You're like, I'm fine. My friends, the warfare, please catch this. The warfare that the enemy brings to marriage is to disrupt God's purpose. He wants to disrupt what God wants to do in and through your marriage. Pay attention to that. I don't know if you ever noticed, but man, in marriage, we fight over dumb stuff. Am I the only one? Hey, y'all are leaving <laughs> me hanging up here. Do you ever find yourself in the middle of a, mar in a, of a fight and you go, what was the fight about? In the beginning, man, we used to fight. And with the, the, listen, I'm not a good fighter. Because I'll just repeat what she says just louder. <laughs> What's wrong? What's wrong? <laughs> and then when I, get, when I get animated, I lose my way and I start to, 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 to not speak proper English and she, the worst thing she would used to do is correct my grammar. <laughs> but you don't get to correct my grammar in the middle of this fight. So what you're, what you're trying to say is, no, dare me, don't correct my grammar. <laughs> okay, verdict. So when I fight, I want to go to my first language. <laughs> Please hear me. The enemy wants to disrupt God's purpose for you. 
please, can we, can we establish your spouse is not the enemy? Your spouse is not the enemy. Your spouse is not the enemy. But to get there, my friends, we have to establish the most important issue in marriage, according to one of the marriage experts that we use his curriculum for marriage classes. He says, you've got to establish the most important issue in marriage. You, you, you ready? Go ahead. The most important issue in marriage is this. Your spouse is not your savior. See, a lot of the struggle that we have in marriage is that we are hoping indirectly that this person is supposed to make your life all better. Indirectly, that's what people are saying. She's supposed to make me happy. Or he's supposed to make me happy. Well, he or she is not a savior. This is why a godly marriage is different from just a marriage. Right from the beginning, again, going back to Genesis, when God created Adam, he didn't create Eve right away. Why is that? Please catch this, it's important. When God created Adam, the first thing God wanted to do is establish his relationship with Adam first before he brought another person into the picture. In other words, every single one of us must first establish our relationship with our creator so we're not looking for a created being to be our creator. So it's, this is so critical. This is why you have to be careful to be unequally yoked because you are waiting and hoping that this person is going to be your happiness. And then you realize, wow, this person is jacked up just like I am. I used to do this illustration with young people. Then I'm like, oh, you want a date? You're 15. And, and I would bring a bench press and I would put it on stage and I would bring a 15-year-old. I'm like, go ahead, try to bench press 100 pounds. And they will struggle with 100 pounds. Then I'm like, you know what? 100 pounds, you're struggling. How about we put 200? Because that's what you're doing when you're dating. You can barely handle your weight. Now you want to add another person's weight. Guess what? You're going to crumble because you don't have what it takes to handle another person's weight at 15 or 16. So we must establish this. Your spouse is not your savior. You do have a savior. His name is Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of your faith. So by the time God brings Eve to the picture, God had already established your most important relationship was with me. And if both of you have a great relationship with me, then your marriage will be a blessing. But if you're missing that, you're going to try to fit each other's savior complex. Sometimes you hear people say, he's not saved, but you know, I'm going to get him to church. I'm going to save him. Good luck with that. You'll barely save yourself. <laughs> Only, my friends, I know this is, this, is, this is basic, but I'm going to say it. Only God can meet your basic needs. The basic human needs are four things, right? We all need four things. Acceptance, identity, security, and purpose. Let me say it again. All human beings need acceptance, identity, security, and purpose. If you're not getting that from your creator, you're trying to get it from some other people. Sometimes we try to get it from our jobs, we try to get it from side hustles, we try to get it from side gigs. Or worst is when you're married, you're trying to get it from people who are not your spouse. If you don't establish that, your marriage will always struggle. That only my creator can give me my basic needs. What the other person will do is complement those needs. Remember, the word is compatibility. Whoever God brings into your life complements your acceptance, your identity, your security, and your purpose, but they cannot give you those things. You only get that from your creator. That's why, whether you're married or not, the most important thing you will do is cultivate your relationship with God. Even today, we are happily married, but man, I need to be with my creator. I need, because the more I spend time with my creator, the better I am to the, create, to, to the creator, be it. I'm a better father, better husband, better person when I spend time with my creator. Because then I can bring something to the table I'm not looking to just take. Come on, is this making sense? Each spouse, my friends, must trust Jesus as their Lord and Savior. 
If not, you're trying to get your significant other to save you. And you're going to be, always be in trouble. This is why it's funny. It's not funny, but it's kind of funny. When you see like teenagers with a broken heart. It's like, first of all, you shouldn't be in a relationship in the first place. But number two, you thought another 15-year-old is going to save you? <laughs> That's how much you know. But you think you know everything. I'm just saying this in love. <laughs> I want to I I tap into my inner Michael Jackson. All in love. Just love. <laughs> so, once you establish that, then you can get to the really heart of what it takes to have a godly marriage. You ready? Number one, Ephesians says, it takes mutual submission. It takes that both are on the same page. You don't have to be the same person. You just have to be on the same page. And what is that? It's this. There is a mission for the Christian marriage to obey and glorify God as a unit. There is a mission for the Christian marriage to obey and glorify God as a unit. We are a team. Two becomes one. My wife and I are very different people, but we're on the same page. When we were dating, we spent a lot of time just getting to know each other. That's another thing, young people. Getting to know each other is not getting in the back of a car and suck each other's face. You know, some people, you, people break up, they're like, I feel like I don't even know who he is. Like, you never knew who he was. All you did was spread COVID. <laughs> Get to know the person. Because marriage is going to be a step of faith no matter what. But I'll never forget, one of my mentors told me, yes, it's a step of faith, but do all the homework you can. Do all the homework you can before you take the leap of faith. There's a mission for the Christian marriage to obey and glorify God as a unit. And, and the Bible is clear. We talked about this last week, but it's clear that there is, there is, this, there is this flow from a man to the woman and then to the kids. There's, the word actually that he uses, it's, it's actually a military word of ranking. So that there is structure. In other words, it's not all over the place. No, there's, there's, a, there's a structure. In other words, like the man, as the head, says, I'm here to care for this family. I'm here to serve this family. I'm here to look for the best interests of this family. The man says, I, I am one with my wife and must think and act that way. Because my job, my responsibility is to represent God to my family. So you can't take that lightly. And the woman says, my husband is the head of our oneness. And I need to respect and defer to him as the head. Mutual submission. We're on the same page. It's not, you know, I get to be the head. No, it's we're on the same page. The model, as Paul says here, is who? Jesus. Jesus is the head of the church. But Jesus doesn't say, hey, look, I'm the head. Jesus says, I'm the head. Let me show you how to serve. Let me show you how to serve. I came to serve you, not to be served. So the husband taps into his inner Jesus, which is the Holy Spirit, to be like Jesus to the wife, to be like Jesus to his kids, to be like Jesus to his family. Are you tracking? The husband is the head of the team. Every team needs a captain. The one flesh relationship, as Christ takes care of the church, so does the husband. That's the responsibility of the husband that God put on him. Husbands are proactive in their self-denial for the sake of the family. I tell, I tell young guys all the time, listen, if you're not ready to let go of the bachelor life, you're not ready to be married. Because what I see a lot of struggles in marriage is people get married, but they still want to live like they're single. 
And now you're jacking up the very thing that God trusted you with. So make up your mind. It's either you're all in or don't. And can I just say some, some, some young people, some of the most powerful years of my life was being single. To cultivate my relationship with him and to get to know myself so I knew what I wanted to get into. So don't look at single years like it's a curse year. It's actually the most the blessed years of your life to be able to center yourself. So wives submit because the husband loves her sacrificially like Jesus does. Because why would you submit to something that's not good for you? So the husband leads the way. That's why the better word for submission, you heard me say this before, i said it again. The better word for submission is the word permission. We give each other permission to speak into each other's lives. Because I know you care about me, I trust you to lead me. I trust you to lead our family. Many times when we, when we need to make decisions for the family, my wife will say, I trust you. I mean, I see all of it, but I trust you. I trust your leadership. I trust that, that you have taken time to be with God and to ask him what we need to do. We literally just had this conversation over Broxton. We're just making some decisions, and she's like, I'm not seeing all of it, but I'm, I trust that you've been with God. There's this mutual trust, and, and it doesn't mean we're better a thousand, because no one does. But there's this trust that builds as we go along. Can you say amen? amen? We give each other permission. That's a better word for submission. So for that to work, my friends, we must learn to speak each other's language. Because we're different. I don't care what much society is trying to say. Men and women are different. Let's just be honest. Let's just like, that's just basic. So we must learn to speak each other's language. And I want to give you a couple of things that are so critical if we're going to have healthy, godly marriages. I'm going to start with you ladies. <laughs> I say that and I get worried. Like, every lady is like... <laughs> Number one need of a man, get this. This will change your life if you're married or you want to be married. Number one need of a man is this. A man needs to be treated with honor and respect. I thought I would get a sounding in man for the man. Why would you leave me up here? I thought we were on the same team. Dudes are like, I was with you, but ain't, you know, just... No, let's be real. This is, this is how God wired us. A man will respond to you if you treat him with honor and respect. Ladies, we will automatically shut down if we don't hear honor and respect in your tone. Even if you're right. If there's no honor and respect, you lost us. All we hear is whoa, 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 when will she stop? Moving her mouth. But here's the thing. Mutual submission, right? Ladies, you honor and respect them like you would Jesus. Because Jesus trusted him to be your husband. That's why the most important really issue in marriage is, do you have a relationship with Jesus first? A man will run from anything that doesn't look or bring honor and respect. So if you want to get the heart of your man, learn to bring honor and respect to the table. A man will listen when he feels honored and respected and valued. That's the number one reason why so many marriages are in trouble. And you hear it. He doesn't listen to me. Oh, are you talking like that to him? And it would start nagging, but nagging just makes things worse. The Bible actually talks about like a nagging wife in Proverbs. It's just, uh, don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> it's in the Bible. I didn't make it up. It's like a nagging wife is like a dripping faucet. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Like you tighten it. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Next time you think about nagging. Oh, 
obviously there's a flip side to that. The flip side to that is the number one need of a woman, go ahead, it's safety and security. A woman wants to know, can you love me like Jesus loves me? How does Jesus love me? Sacrificially. Like Jesus gave his life for me. So dude, do you have that in you to make me feel safe and secure? Not just physically, but emotionally and spiritually. Young people, you're somewhere and the dude you like is there and all of a sudden there's a commotion there's a fight and he runs you got your answer he's not the one he should be like are you good are you okay let me take you somewhere safe something's going on in the house and he's like I can't deal with this I'm leaving that's a problem Houston the man Supposed to bring safety and security to the relationship. Even if we're scared, we're tapping into the Holy Spirit. You need to help me right now. People tell me all the time, Pastor, you have this face like, it seems like, it's like, yeah, you should see the storms on the inside. Because some things you got to keep down until there's time. This, I'm, not, I'm not advocating for keeping things down, but there's a time to just say, not right now. I need to be here for my family. I need to be the man right now. I need to be the focus right now. I need to stand right now. Here's the problem with someone always threatening to leave. There's no safety in that. There's no security. In it. If you always threaten to leave, you're creating fear and chaos. And you will never establish something healthy that way. So safety and security is important. Why? Because Jesus says, hey, I love you sacrificially. A woman feels mostly secure to a sacrificial husband. That they know, he's got my back. Even if we're broke, he's got my back. We're, we're working on it. We're a work in progress. We're talking about this stuff. He's, he's doing his best. But we're going to work it through. Because he's putting my needs first. He's doing his best. Can you say amen? amen. Back to you ladies. Is this, is this making sense? Is this making sense? Here's one more. Real quick. No, this, this is not the last one, by the way. Like, I'm not wrapping up yet. See, I took time off. I got too much to say to you. Ladies, learn to cover his faults and focus on his strengths. Because it's easy to focus on the faults and highlight the weaknesses. It takes no rocket science to do that. It's easy. Imagine if God always highlighted our faults and focused on our weaknesses. God doesn't see you as you are. He sees you as you're meant to be. So ladies... Get this, this is a powerful statement. Hear me on this. The devil in the Bible is called the accuser. Don't agree with him. When you're accusing, you're agreeing with the devil. And let me give you an insight into a man's heart and mind. This is a true story. We already feel beat up. We already feel we don't measure up. Like, we're already struggling. And so when you highlight it, it makes it worse. This is why a guy will shut down on you because he's like, man, I already know. I already know I'm, I'm, I'm struggling right now. I already know that I'm not where I need to be. And now you're reminding me instead of speaking into my life, instead of prophesying, instead of encouraging, instead of helping. <laughs> Notice this, right? It's, isn't it interesting? Every Sunday we gather as God's people. What is the first thing that we do? We praise God. We enter his gates with what? Praise and thanksgiving. If that's the first number one priority in our relationship with God, and God created us in his image, why don't you think that our relationship needs to start with praise and thanksgiving? We need more praise and thanksgiving at home. 
What was the last time you were like, man, you, you handsome, you. I like what you got going on. Look at you going to work. <laughs> I love the way you, you play with the kids. Man, look at you cutting that grass. <laughs> Let me get you some lemonade. You look like you're working hard. Instead of, you done yet? You clearly didn't do the bushes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, <I'm> just... <laughs> My friends, fellas, back me up on the statement. A man wants a thankful wife. Now, the flip side of that. <laughs> girls are like, come on, bring it. Bring the flip side. Give me the flip side. The flip side of that is this, fellas. You need to have... Dude's like, wrap it up right here. That was good. <laughs> Fellas, this is work for us. We need to have open and honest communication. I'm telling you, this is, this is, this is critical. Because she doesn't know what's going on with you. And we get mad because we, we want them to know somehow. I'll never forget in our marriage counseling, I don't remember much, but I remember this, the counselor said, <laughs> he said, and I'll never forget this, before we got married, we did premarital, he said, nobody has a crystal ball. But I swear, two, three years into our marriage, we're like, how come she not know? Well, did you tell her? So don't assume. See, psychologists are saying this. I just read this. It blew my mind. They're like, the longer you are with someone, the less you know what they're thinking. You're just assuming you know what they're thinking. So open and honest communication. And this is how she connects to our world, fellas. She wants to know what's going on because we don't have a hard time opening up. So when she says, how was your day? She's looking for details. <laughs> she wants the events and the feelings attached to the, to the day. Right? Think about it. I get home. How was your day? It was, right. it was good. How about you, honey? And I get a book. Well, it started when my mom called me and we talked about the weather and my gosh, it's so hot everywhere. And then the kids want to go in the pool and then, um, you know, Caleb was acting up and it's like, uh. All right, it's scientifically proven that we ladies use more words than men. By the time we get home, we already lost all our words. Five o'clock came around. You're like, I'm out of words. But it's so important. Please hear me on this. Fellas, it's so important. We need to be intentional about our communication. So here is my recommendation. I recommend this to other couples when I do marriage uh, counseling is set a time weekly where you're actually having conversation. Because the whole week will go by. you just be passing each other. We're so busy. Is there a set time where you're like, I've prepared my mind to have a conversation. Like I've set this time. I don't, l look at your week. I don't know how your week is. You know, for us, it used to be Friday nights. It was like, our kids are going to bed. We need to check in. Have that intentionally. Don't assume that you are on the same page. Make time to talk. And fellas, no excuses because this is too important. You signed up for this when you said, I do. Man, I'm running out of time again. I'm going to keep going, though. Another key ingredient, another key ingredient, this, this will blow your mind. But look, look at this revelation. We need to have this fun and friendship in our marriages.
like life is already so serious. We don't need to have somber homes. Like when you were dating, you were adventurous. Now you're boring. Man, I remember when we used to date, and she had a semester left of school. We went, both went to school in Boston, and I graduated. She still had a semester left. And, man, I would drive to Boston, and, and it felt like a breeze because I was so in love. I was like, I can't wait to see her. <laughs> Could care less about gas price. You know, you just like, just. Six, 17 years later, she's like, pick me up. I'm like, Why? Can you get a ride? Is Mariah there? No, we need to go back to that. Don't stop dating your spouse. We went out with a couple from the church yesterday. They've been married 29 years, and they said something that stood with us, and they're like, we determined 10 years ago that date night is non-negotiable. We're going. We're going to cultivate our date night. And, and they were like, sometimes we'd be fighting and go, we're still going to eat. We're still going out. <laughs> Ladies, can I just say something? I already said a lot. <laughs> we don't need a mother. We need a friend. By nature, you're nurturers, but guess what? You didn't marry a kid. Well, that, that's debatable. That's debatable. Because you're like, got socks everywhere. Your kids got socks everywhere. It's like, now you're the sixth child in the family, you know. But like, we need to be careful not to mother, but to be a friend. I don't know about you guys, but listen, I really mean this. My wife is my best friend. Absolutely best friend. We just came back from vacation and we did a week with the kids and then a week alone I was like this is amazing I'm spending a week with my favorite person in the world forget those kids and I tell the kids often I'm like you don't understand this this came first and one day y'all leaving <laughs> all right so this is gonna be first without this there's no you knuckleheads hey this is my best friend. Hey, put me in a desert island. Just give me her. Forget the kids. They'll figure it out. <laughs> Your husband will open up when you guys are friends. Because you're talking to a friend. It's the best thing that we have about our marriage is that we were friends first. Just friends. Until one day I was like, oh, baby, you got what I need. And you say, we're just a friend. And you say, oh, baby, you, you got what I need. <laughs> Guys, we got to mix it up. Tell your spouse, stop being boring. Take an interest in our world. How about that? I've had to do that. We have very different interests. Stuff that she wants to watch, I'm like, oh. <laughs> Cooking channel again? <laughs> then I was like, all right, Rachel Ray, all right, Rachel Ray, what's she cooking today? <laughs> like, the movie she wants to watch, I'm like, oh, kill me. <laughs> Another one of these. Sometimes I'll watch a movie with her, she'll fall asleep, and I'll put on like a manly movie just to feel man again. <laughs> like, seriously, watch some Hallmark movie, I'm like, oh God. <laughs> she'll start falling asleep, gladiator, I need to be a man again. <laughs> just need to be a man again. 300, ah! <laughs> but take an interest, and then she falls asleep, and you can just... Oh, guys, I wrote this on my note, I got to tell you. You want to be really sexy? You want to be really sexy? 
Help around the house. Help around the house. When I realized that, when she was working at Bradley Hospital and we were both working full time and we had two, two kids and I realized that our love language is, is acts of service, man, I became the sexiest man alive. I would time it. It's like almost time to her to come home, put something for the kids to watch and I go to the dishes and I start just hustling on the dishes and I'm like, I'm going to be the sexiest man in the world. And it works. Which leads me to my last point. Go ahead, my last point. You can throw it up. <laughs> Sex. Now, we got kids in the room, and they keep this very PG. I don't know if you know this, but there's an entire book in the Bible that only talks about romance and sex. Did you know that? It's two books in the Bible we avoid. We avoid Leviticus and Songs of Songs. Songs of Songs, all about marriage, all about sex, all about romance. I went back and reread it yesterday. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> like, Jesus, this is in your word. Like, you made sure this was here. Which, which I got this revelation. You ready for this revelation? If your sex life is lame, don't blame God. He put it in his word. So much that he's like, I'm going to give you an entire book just on it. But I'm talking to married people here. That, man, it's a beautiful thing. You know, the society has hijacked it and distorted it and make it all nonsense. But then when God created it, he's like, man, I had something good for you. I wanted to bless you. I wanted you to be able to have pleasure with the person you're spending the rest of your life with. I want that to be the greatest thing that you do with nobody else. And it's sacred. It's beautiful. It's powerful. It's fun. Cultivate it. But all the things we talked about leads to this. You have a great sex life when you have a great communication life. You have a great sex life when you're working together. Because here's the, here's the bottom line about sex, right? Watch this. Man, man, we, we talked about this. This is my cue. Man, sex stimulates emotions for the man. Ladies, we're not perverts. We're just sexual beings. That's how God wired us. Okay. But, uh, but I'm not talking about cheap sex. I'm talking about real sex. Cheap sex is just interaction between two strangers. But deep sex is when you're connected, mind, body, and spirit. That those are the best kind of sex you will ever have. With the person that you're doing life with. And you love deeply. So for the man, sex stimulates our emotion. And for the woman... Here's the flip side. Emotion stimulates sex. That's why all the things you think is not sexual become sexual for her. Non-sexual touches. Like, just, I, I, I see you, baby. I see you. I see you working hard. I see you taking care of the kids. You coming home and helping around the house, she's like, oh, man, this is helpful. Guess what? You're, you're stirring her emotions to want to be with you. Because you don't do jack around the house, then you want sex. She's like... I know I'm supposed to submit, but you didn't do jack. He told you to serve. <laughs> oh, y'all ain't going to talk to me. But here's the thing. God rewards character. The more you're working on each other separately and then coming together, the more blessed your sex life is. It's a beautiful thing. Nothing to be ashamed of. We can't let the enemy hijack something that God created. And we need to teach our kids the right way. By the way, in Songs of Songs, I read yesterday five, six different times it says, do not awaken love until it's time. In other words, come together in holy matrimony. Let God bless you. Then you can have the best sex you will ever have. Young people, trust God's plan. Trust God's way. He will bless you. The more you honor each other, the better your sex life. And lastly, my friends, worship team, you can come. It's you got to create a family altar to pray for each other. I got to rush here, but man, this point is so important. 
this point right here, listen. Allow the Holy Spirit to be the enforcer in your relationship. In other words, if you both have a relationship with Jesus, you don't have to force them to change. Trust Jesus to change them. I guarantee you, ladies, trust me, Jesus is on your side. I speak from experience. I lose every fight with my wife. Every time I got to come around, be like, I'm sorry. Because Jesus won't let me off the hook. So, trust me, you want, you want to see change in your family? Even if they're not saved, if you're already married, the Bible even gives you grace for that. It says, pray for your spouse. Because you're covering your house. Like, you don't have to pray together every day, but pray for each other no matter where you are. Just pray for each other. And pray specifically. I'm telling you, the more specific you are, the more conviction comes. There's been times that, that I'll say something to my wife. She's like, I've been praying about that. I'm like, I had no chance. <laughs> Just never had a chance. <laughs> because, listen, last point. Pray about the changes you want to see. Speak it into existence in your family. I love praying for my kids when they're sleeping because it's like, Holy Spirit, work now. Just work on them. Just mold them. Shape them. Have your way. Bless my wife. Bless our marriage. Bring the Holy Spirit into the mix. Don't make any drastic decisions without inviting the Holy Spirit into it. Young people, I really believe this with my heart. Your single years are the most important years of your life. Let the Holy Spirit mold you and shape you into the man or woman he wants you to be. Because the more you do that, the less you're looking for a savior. You're looking for someone to be compatible with and do life with and do journey with. When I, when I used to be a youth pastor, I used to have this analogy. I would bring a bench press to the, to the stage. And I would call out a 15-year-old and be like, Hey, come here. I want you to try to bench press 100 pounds. And most 15-year-olds can't bench 100 pounds. It's like a struggle. Then I'd be like, you know, you're struggling. You know what I need to do? I need to add another 100 pounds to that. Now they're like, oh, what do you mean I can't do that? I'm like, yeah, that's, that's you trying to have a relationship with 15. You can barely handle your own weight, and you're going to put another with some person's weight, it's going to crumble you. So why don't you wait until you got some weight on you? You can handle some stuff. And you know yourself. And you can handle the adversity because marriage is work. You got to work out your salvation, and then you got to help your family. Serious challenge. But we all up for it because we have the Lord with us. Can you say amen? Stand with me as we pray this morning. Pray for each other as a team. I'm gonna I'm gonna invite you. If you're if you're married right now and your spouse is here, can you can you guys hold hands like you love each other? You just so in love. If you're not married yet, hold your own hand and prophesy. Seriously, though, be the best man you can be right now. Don't wait till you get married. It's too late. Be the best woman you can be right now. The best version of yourself right now. Because God is looking at you now and saying, can I trust you with one of my daughters? Can I trust you to be a sacrificial husband one day? So let's pray together. Would you bow your heads with me? Spirit of living God, we come upon your presence with humility. We come to submit our lives to you, Lord. We come to you because we know the greatest relationship we have is with you. Jesus, you give us our acceptance, our identity. You give us our purpose. Father, we want to be good stewards of what you trusted us with. We want to be good stewards of the marriage you've blessed us with. We want to be good stewards of the kids you've blessed us with, the house, the home, the family you gave us. So we come to, once again, be fully submitted to you, Lord. We come to lay down our hurts to you, our disappointments, our shortcomings. We come to ask you to revive our marriage, restore our passion for one another, our joy, our romance. We come to help us, to ask you, Spirit, help us to speak each other language. 
Help us to serve one another in mutual submission because we're here to obey you and to glorify you together. I pray for any marriage that's in a place of brokenness. I pray healing. I pray restoration. I pray you affirm the covenant once again, Lord. Renew our vows. And if if marriages are good, make it better, Lord. Bless our marriage once again. Bless our children. Bless our home. Bless our finances, Lord. Everything that is ours is yours. I want to lift up those who are not married, Father. I pray that even now they begin to allow you to mold them and shape them. And if there's anyone in this room or watching who doesn't have a relationship with you, Lord, I pray that they understand the greatest relationship is with you first. So if that's you, take a moment and invite the Lord into your life. Simply asking Jesus to come into your life and to forgive you of your sins and to follow him, to really make a decision. Lord, I want to follow you. I want your will. I don't want to get ahead of you. I don't want to do it my own way. So forgive me of my sins and come into my life. Be my Lord, my Savior. I want to be yours. I want to live in the fullness of your will. So Holy Spirit, have your way with every single one of us in this place, watching online. Our hearts is open. Our minds are receptive. Speak, Lord. Speak, Lord. We want to be godly in this evil and perverted generation. May, may we shine. May we be your people. And we pray these things in Jesus' name.